I'm Charles Passy, and this is my co-host, Stephanie Kelton. It is going to be a lot of fun today. So for those of you who don't know about the podcast, let me just tell you a little bit about the show. Each week, we explore innovations in economics, finance, technology, and policy that rethink the way we live, work, spend, save, and invest. Great. And we are pleased to welcome Katie Milkman for this special live version of our podcast. Uh, Katie is a Wharton professor and a behavioral economist, and we've actually had her on the show before. Um, uh, around when she published her book, How to Change, The Science of Getting from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be. She's also a seasoned podcaster, host of her own podcast called Choiceology. I think I have that right. Uh, Katie, you've devoted your career to studying behavioral change. And you use a term that we'd like you to explain, the snudge. What the heck is a snudge? Yes, thank you for that great question. Um, a snudge is a self-nudge. If you're familiar with the book by um, Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler about nudges, they're small changes that can be made to an environment. Uh, that They don't change your incentives, but they may reshape your decisions through an understanding of your psychology by making things easier or more apparent or more attractive. So a snudge is when you nudge yourself towards some better outcome. Okay, so today we're talking about how you can improve your productivity at work using things like snudges and breaking bad habits using the Snudge. idea of a snudge, <laughs> snudging your way out of a bad habit. So I'm curious, I would love to hear from both of you what work habits you would like to break and I'll start, I'll share mine. My bad habit is multitasking, trying to do too many things and not finishing a thing and having too much going on at once. Charles? Uh, I'm a procrastinator. As my bosses know, I usually wait to the last minute to do anything that has a deadline. And um, my bad habit would have to be too much time on social media when I should be focusing on writing projects. Hmm. Okay, so <laughs> one of the things that we've all seen over the last two plus years with the pandemic was people going to work from home. And now millions of people going back into the workplace. And it seems like this is a possibility for people to sort of have a new start, right? Establish some new behavioral patterns. And I know that you've written about that in your book. Can you talk about that? Yes, I would love to share some of my research on this, which I hope will be helpful to all of you. Um, the phenomenon is something we call the fresh start effect. And it actually is, it has a really interesting origin in the way we think about time as human beings. It turns out we don't think about time linearly, but when we reflect on our lives, um, there's this whole literature and autobiographical memory that shows we think about ourselves like we're characters in a book. And um, there are chapters in that book. And the chapters of our lives are bounded by major events like moving to a new community, you might you know, have the college years, uh, you might have the Boston years, the New York years, where you're living, um, where you're working, who you're surrounded with. So those are major chapter breaks when you pivot from one to another. But there are also minor chapter breaks. And all of these chapter breaks, whether it's the start of a new year, which if you think about fresh starts, it's a major one that motivates us to set resolutions. Um, there are minor ones as well. And we've studied all these chapter breaks that are salient to people and give us the sense of that clean slate, new beginning, motivate us to step back and think big picture about our goals. And some of the regular occurrences in your life that can feel like a fresh start include the start of a new week, um, the start of a new month, the celebration of a birthday, holidays that feel like fresh starts. So think Labor Day more than Valentine's Day for most of us. And we've looked at data set after data set and seen natural spikes in when people invest in goals. So for instance, we look at when people search for the term diet and we see spikes at the start of a new week, month, year, uh, following holidays that feel like fresh starts. When we look at when people visit the gym more frequently, the very same people visit more at the start of a new week, month, year, following birthdays, um, following holidays that feel like fresh starts. And goal setting on a popular goal setting app also spikes at those fresh start dates. And it's not just about health, because everything I just mentioned was about health. We see the same thing when we look at financial goals. We see the same thing when we look at workplace goals, educational goals, um, when we look at goals around your uh, environmental uh, goals. So all of these categories show the same fresh start effect. And we're certainly experiencing a fresh start now. Tomorrow's the first day of fall. 
right after Labor Day, going back to the office. These are moments when, um, because it feels like a chapter break in our lives, we're more likely to feel we have a clean slate, a fresh start, and want to step back and think big picture. So like people, individuals, ha can have this fresh start feeling, but what about as the influx of workers come back? You have supervisors and managers who are welcoming back teams of workers. Are there things that they can do? Can they also take advantage of the fresh start idea? Yeah, it's a great question. One of the really neat things we've shown about the fresh start effect in our work, and I should say this is work jointly with Heng Chen Dai of UCLA, um, we have looked at how we can nudge people, not a snudge, here, but how a manager can nudge an employee towards uh, making better decisions, say, about their finances or pursuing some kind of goal. And by simply calling attention to fresh start dates on the calendar that people might not otherwise have noticed in the context of encouraging goal setting, we can do this. So one example is highlighting um, the first day of spring on a calendar when you're asking people, you know, when are you going to start pursuing this goal? all of a sudden there's a whole lot of interest in pursuing goals at that new date, as opposed to just marking it as the third Thursday in um, March, for instance. Also, we did an experiment where we invited people to start saving for retirement. About 2,000 people who were not currently saving, and we either invited them to start saving in a few months' time, on a sort of arbitrary date, or after an upcoming birthday, or after the start of spring. Literally, it's actually the same, but in one case, we're calling attention to the fact that the timeline when we're inviting you to start saving is the start of spring or your birthday, a fresh start date. And we see about 20 to 30% increase in saving over the next nine months just from changing the timeline of when we encourage people to begin. You've given us a lot of different times to have a fresh start. Are, are they all created equal? Yeah, it's a great question. Some are absolutely more salient than others, right? 40% of Americans set New Year's resolutions. That's the big fresh start we all converge on. But in terms of nudging or trying to encourage someone to change behavior, we've actually seen better results when um, it's not a fresh start that's already top of mind. When you nudge someone, for instance, and say, don't you want to start saving after the new year? They've already thought about their New Year's resolutions. They didn't need a little push. But when you call attention to a date like a birthday or the beginning of spring where there might not have been so much focus, you can see benefits. One other thing I want to just say is that you cannot artificially create these out of nothing. We tried some experiments with that to say, hey, it's the 100th day of the year. Don't you want to start pursuing your goals? We get n n absolutely zilch, right? So you, you can't manufacture them. But every Monday is a, a fresh start. We see big increases on Monday, even relative to Tuesday and Wednesday. So they come about often enough with real meaning where they resonate with people that you can use those. So, so you've decided to make a change. Can I say you've snudged yourself? I don't know if that's a term. <laughs> um, how do you make that into an actual habit? Because that's where I think I get into trouble. Yeah, habits are hard to form, first of all, but there is a science to them, and there's some, been some wonderful popular books that talk about this. My own, of course, touches on it, but if you've read um, Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, Atomic Habits, those books really, they mostly get the science right that what you want to do is think about it like practice. If you want to learn a new skill, like get really good at playing a piece on the piano, you sit down and you practice and you repeat and you celebrate small successes. And that, that repetition is how habits are built. You very deliberately can build a habit by trying to repeat this action as frequently as possible. Um, and, and creating some stability in the context is valuable. But I want to tell you about one surprising finding around habits uh, that my collaborators and I had when we ran an experiment with about 2,500 Google employees who wanted to build exercise habits at the start, actually, of a new year. Uh, so it was a fresh start. Everybody wants to build these habits. And we experimented with a couple of different ways of helping them do that. And our end goal was to build a little program that would last for a month, but then carry people forward so they'd exercise regularly after our program ended. And we tested two versions of the program. In one version, we encouraged people and rewarded them for exercising in a very consistent um, manner, meaning everybody tells us what's their ideal time to work out, and they actually got rewarded for showing up at that time and that time only. So people tell us seven to nine, that's my ideal workout window, and by encouraging them in this way, we got them to do about 80% of their workouts during that sort of ideal time. 
The other group is encouraged to build in more variety as they're trying to form the habit for this first month. So they're in habit startup mode, and instead of always doing it at the same time, we encourage them, pick your ideal time, go then some, but also mix it up. So what this leads to is about 50% of their workouts at the same ideal window, and the rest more varied. Both groups exercise about the same frequency, just in these different patterns. And then the program ends, we look who has the more robust lasting habit, and surprisingly to many psychologists who we surveyed, and frankly to us, we actually saw that it was better to exercise less regularly. So same frequency, but more variable in the timing. And when we dug into the data to figure out what was going on, why did this lead to more robust habits and more robust behavior change that, that lasts beyond the end of our program, what we see is that we were sort of right in thinking that some degree of consistency and timeline builds builds that habit. So if you're a 9 a.m. workout person and you go at 9 a.m. for a month, you keep going at 9 a.m. a little bit more than the person who had a more variable routine. But if you miss 9 a.m., you don't go at all. And that is the big important catch. The people who had been a little less rigid in when they visited the gym, they built more robust habits. So they miss their 9 a.m., they still show up later in the day. So big takeaway for us from this and, and resonates with other research that's been coming out since is that while it's good to repeat and have some degree of consistency, you actually want to throw yourself some curveballs when you're trying to build a habit, whether, whether it's around meditation, whether it's around you know, when you're gonna have your um, focused work time, get your writing done today, whether it's about when you're gonna practice on Duolingo or exercise. And that variability is gonna teach you that when life throws you a curveball, when you, you know, hit traffic in the morning on the way to drop off your kid, or uh, something else goes wrong, you have a backup plan, and you'll still fall back and find a way to get your habit done. How long does it take to form a habit? Oh, I love that you asked me that question, because one of my favorite myths is that there is um, a magic answer. And in fact, there is one magic number that I've heard thrown around a lot, you might have heard too, which is 30 days to form a habit. That's, that's one popular myth. Um, Wendy Wood, who's a professor at USC and an expert on habits, once told me that she dug into where that myth came from, and she thinks that she's pinpointed it, that there was a study done of people who'd had plastic surgery, and surveys were done of how long it took them to get used to their new face, and that was about 30 days, and therefore this legend was born that it's 30 days to form a habit. Anyway. I don't know how true that is, but it's sure a great story, and the research does not support that magic number. Um, there's some work that's, that I've been involved in, led by Colin Kammerer of Caltech, using machine learning to try to figure out, in really large populations of both gym goers and hospital caregivers, who, um, how long does it take gym goers to form a habit around exercise? How long does it take caregivers uh, to form a habit around sanitizing their hands when they enter and exit patient rooms? And what's interesting is the answer is really different in those different contexts. You won't be shocked to learn. It takes longer to form a gym habit where you're going less frequently um, than to form a habit around hand sanitizing where you're doing it several times a day. Hand sanitizing habits seem to take, on average, order of magnitude a couple of weeks to form, whereas gym habits more like a couple of months. And the, the speculation is that it's going to be different depending on the context, but the more frequently you engage in the behavior, the less complex it is, the faster you'll be able to form that habit. So that's forming the habit, but then maintaining it. You're saying the more often you kind of have to do it, the easier it is to maintain the habit, or are there tricks that you can adopt as well to keep that habit going? Yeah, there are tricks you can adopt. Certainly frequency and sort of intensity, when you have a desire to form a habit, High frequency is beneficial. Try to use that burst of energy you get at New Year's to go to the gym as frequently as possible so it will start to become routine. You won't even have to think about it. It's sort of you're working it into your day. You've got your backup plan, your first best plan. And now, you know, when the motivation wanes, you've got the habit sort of carrying you forward. That, that idea makes sense, although I should say only about 30% of the behaviors that we change, say, in a given month in this way end up carrying over. So it's not as though, oh, once you've done it for a month, it's magical, or once you've done it for any period of time, it's magical. Even habits tend to wane. You have to maintain them. But in terms of thinking about what it takes to keep these good behaviors online, one thing that I think is really important is thinking about social support. So 
if you can uh, build a social structure, a social team that supports you in doing the things that you want to do, that can be really powerful. And actually, one of my favorite studies that I've been involved in the last few years that had sort of counterintuitive finding around social support suggests one way that we can uh, help ourselves maintain habits and make good decisions more generally is actually by coaching other people who have similar goals. So we did some research, and I should say this is led by Lauren Estress Winkler at um, Northwestern University's Kellogg School. And what she realized is that one thing that's a barrier to behavior change often into habit maintenance is confidence. And when we mentor and coach others, it helps us build our confidence because it shows us, you know, we're, if we're capable of giving someone else good tips, then we must kind of have things figured out. So it builds our confidence. It also forces us to introspect about what would work for us. If we're talking to other people about, oh, you're trying to maintain a gym habit, or you're trying to build these better habits at work, trying to avoid procrastination, say, or in my case, social media overuse, then um, when you're coaching someone else who's facing a similar struggle and a similar set of goals about how they can achieve it, it's going to force you to introspect more than you might if you were solving the problem for yourself, because now I have to say something to Charles, right? I have to say something to Stephanie to give them wisdom, and I'm gonna come up with insights that are probably self-relevant, because those are the insights I have access to. So I have to think about it more deeply. It builds my confidence, and finally, when I give you advice, I'm gonna feel like a hypocrite if I don't take it myself. So advice giving and, and forming, I actually have my own advice club. Similar people with similar set of goals. I have a professional, um, group of women, we all have similar goals, and we reach out to each other when we run into a stumbling block, and it, it's incredibly valuable to have this advice club because I actually, well, I get you know free consulting, which is amazing every time that I can't figure out what to do, um, social support in general for anything I'm trying to achieve, but also, interestingly, as I coach these other women in this group, it has improved my own decision making and my own confidence and helped me maintain um, better habits. I've got one final question. It's one I've been dying to ask. So we, we talk about New Year's resolutions, plural. You know, and I'll come up with a, a list each year. You know, go to the gym, write the great American novel, uh, wake up at 6 a.m. every day. And I'm wondering if what's going on there. Maybe we should be really talking about New Year's resolutions singular. I mean, is it good to have a lot of goals, or is it better to focus on just a few, or one or two? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked that question too because this is a major mistake that many people make when they have a fresh start, whether it's New Year's or any other time. Um, research by Steven Spiller and collaborators at UCLA has looked at what happens when we set multiple goals and we enumerate plans for reaching multiple goals, which PS is really important to success. I talked a little bit about social support, but another direction we could have gone in that conversation about habit maintenance is um, you've gotta make a really concrete plan, break that big goal, I want to volunteer 200 hours a year, for instance, down into bite-sized pieces. We just ran a massive field experiment with 9,000 people where showing um, that encouraging volunteers who'd committed to 200 hours a year of work, asking them to break that down and say, okay, we're going to do four hours a week or eight hours every two weeks, we see 8% increase in uh, volunteering. So when we break that big goal down into bite-sized pieces, you see better outcomes. Okay, so if you try to break things down, you break it down into those bite-sized pieces, you make a plan, you know, when am I gonna do it? Where am I gonna do it? How am I gonna follow through? Critical to goal success. You do that with more than one goal, you actually get worse outcomes. If you do it with one goal, you get better outcomes. So all of the magic tricks that we can use, all the behavioral science that supports successful goal pursuit, it supports it when we are focusing on a single goal, a single objective at a time. But the minute we enter two goals onto our to-do list and try to use these best practices, we overwhelm ourselves. It feels impossible to get it all done once you enumerate the plan you need to make and leads to worse results. So one goal at a time. We're, we're almost out of time, speaking of, of time. Um, any last minute thought? Well, one last thing I wanna say is that um, both of you were talking about how to quit things, right? You wanna quit procrastinating or quit being distracted, right? I wanna quit social media. A lot of our objectives in the workplace are about stopping, not starting, and there's some different magic sauce that you can use from science to help with that. Um, I'll just leave you with the thought that sometimes we want to impose constraints on ourselves. Normally, we're used to other people doing it, right? You get a speeding ticket if you drive too fast. Somebody else slaps a penalty on you. But a commitment device is a tool you can use to actually impose penalties on yourself if you procrastinate. 
and there's some websites that can let you put money on the line that will, you'll have to forfeit if you fail to achieve your goals. Um, and you can name a referee. And they're very helpful. Research shows that just having access to this kind of a tool can, for instance, help smokers quit at a 30% higher rate. So think about commitment devices if you want to quit instead of start. Building new habits and gambling. I love it all together. <laughs> That's all we have time for today, Katie. Uh, it was a pleasure talking with you. And everyone, if you haven't out already, check out the Best New Ideas in Money podcast. We have new episodes every Thursday. Thank you so much. This episode was a special live taping from the Best New Ideas in Money Festival. Go to marketwatch.com to watch highlights from the festival and learn more. I'm Stephanie Kelton. And I'm Charles Passy. The Best New Ideas in Money is a podcast for Market Watch. The producers are Michael McDowell, Meta Lutzhoft, and Katie Ferguson, who edited and mixed this episode. Melissa Haggerty is the executive producer. Jeremy Binks is our news editor, and Tim Rawston is the executive editor for Market Watch. The Best New Ideas in Money theme was composed by Sam Retzer. Special thanks this week to Nathan Vardy, Alia Aljunaid, Mark Renfrey, Rebecca Bisdale, Suzanne Foy, and Lindsay Meck. Stephanie Kelton is an economist and a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University and not part of the MarketWatch newsroom. We'll be back next week with another new idea.